So thanks, thanks folks for coming. Um, if, if you were not here um, and did not watch the first video, watch the first video. Um, and I, I, I include that for people who may be watching video number two, but, but watch the first video. The first video, um, we tried to go over some of the you know, ancient history from, the, from kind of the, the, the dawn of the Bible up through the Roman period, which, which covers, as I think Neil pointed out, um, what ordinarily is 18 hours of lecture into one. Um, but, but just to give you an idea of what you're going to be seeing. Um, but uh, even though people, so what we're going to do today, anyway, is, is we're, going to, we're going to look at uh, three things. We're going to, first of all, talk about history uh, since the Roman period. It's helpful to know about some of the things you're going to, you're going to see there. Uh, we're going to do a brief overview of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and what we are, are and are not going to do. And um, some basic logistical things to know and to remember for the trip. And I will send out emails with a lot of that stuff, so don't, don't worry about having to write it down right now, but, but take notes on important things, obviously, as you, as you feel uh, you'd like to. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is a little bit of the, the history since the Roman period. There has been 2,000 years of history uh, since the Roman period, and even though we know this intellectually when we go to places, um, we sort of have this feeling of, I'm going to, I'm going to walk into a place that was historical from the 16th century, the 8th century, the 1st century, and it's going to be just like it was, but 2,000 years of history have happened since then. And because the Middle East and that the whole area of Israel, Pal uh, Israel, Palestine, Jordan, all that area is, is and remains constantly a hotbed of stuff. Lots and lots of people, lots and lots of uh, cultures have come and gone. They have all left their marks on, on some of the things that we're going to see. So um, we're going to begin by talking a little bit about the, um, the, the first period after the Roman period is the Byzantine era. So during the, um, in, in about 330 AD CE, so we're going to use CE sometimes, the common era, in about 330, Constantine, who is you know, the first Christian emperor, although how Christian he was, we're not terribly sure, um, but uh, he was the emperor of the entire Roman emperor, empire, which stretched from you know, England and what is today England down into northern Africa and far down into, into, uh, out, out into Turkey and, and into Egypt and places like that. Um, for uh, administrative ease, he split the empire into two administrative sections. The western part, which was still based in Rome, and he moved his, his capital to a new city, which is today Istanbul, which he uh, very humbly named after himself and called Constantinople. As, uh, as things continued, the, uh, the, the Byzantine emperor, Empire, which is basically this purple area here, continued to be wealthy and powerful for the next several hundred years while the Western Empire really declined. The only, the only thing left really in the West that was a, was a major center was Rome, which is how the Pope ends up, the Bishop of Rome ends up being the, the all-powerful guy in the, in the Western, uh, in Western civilization for several centuries because really the church is the last functioning thing. The, the, the uh, Goths come down, they sack Rome. Um, the government really doesn't much exist uh, as a functional entity later on. But we're going to talk about the Byzantine era. The, uh, the, the time for the next two, three, four hundred years, the, uh, the, the Byzantines uh, had a lot of power, they had a lot of money, uh, they developed the sites in Jerusalem. So one of the things you're going to see um, as we get there, this is an important site, is the, uh, is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. This is the, this is the front door into the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is the which is a massive sprawling complex that is built over the traditional sites of Jesus' crucifixion and burial. I said that Constantine were iffy on whether how much of a Christian he was. He was not baptized until he was on his deathbed, and it seemed to be more of a political thing. But his mother Helena actually was somebody who really did believe and was a Christian long before he was, and so. Uh, she went around right after uh, Constantine issued the Edict of Toleration, which, and that's important, it, it was called the Edict of Toleration. It was legal to be a Christian now. It wasn't, no, everybody didn't suddenly become Christian. But um, 
but armed with Mayan, the mother of the Roman emperor, um, she went to the Holy Land and looked for the sites that were the places that Jesus lived, taught, died, was buried, rose from the dead, um, and frequently she was able to find these places because when Hadrian rebuilt the city of Jerusalem, he plopped pagan temples on sites that were considered holy to Jews and Christians were considered just a Jewish sect. So there was, there, there was a temple that was plopped on the site that Christians had venerated since the first century that said this was the place where Jesus was crucified and buried. So inside, you really can't tell a whole lot, but that piece of real estate around you know, over where the church is, is probably has, has some really good um, cred, credibility of being the actual site. Uh, but the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was built and rebuilt many times, but its original, uh, the original building of it, the, the placement of that, is, dates to the Byzantine era. Um, so the, some, of the, some of the great big places you're going to see are, are places that are left over from that, that time period when, when the church built, when the, when, the, when the emperor, the Justinian especially, built enormous churches over sites that we will see. I included this picture for a couple of reasons. Um, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is a really important site and will we'll be there, but um, we're going to talk towards the end of this period about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the conflicts between Palestinians and uh, or mostly Muslim Palestinians and, and Israel, Jewish Israelis. Um, but to begin with, uh, so, so as to be, to be clear, um, if, if as Christians we go to the Holy Land and, and we want to go to a place that all Christians would, would go to, the place of the death and resurrection of Jesus, and you expect to see Christians of all places and all peoples and tribes and nations and languages come together and hold hands and sing Kumbaya, this is not the place to do it. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre is, uh, is, is run by four or five different denominations. The Franciscans have custody of all the Roman Catholic areas. Uh, but the Greek Orthodox, the Syrian Orthodox, the Coptics, which are the, the, the Egyptian Christians, um, the Armenians, all of them have chunks of that church. And you cannot, if you put the stand in their section, it causes World War III. So um, as, a, as an example, you can't see it clearly here uh, probably right. There's a little. There's a ladder right here. See. So the ladder was put there at some point. No one knows by whom. And since nobody knows who put it there, no one can take it down. Uh, and if you look carefully at these pictures, you'll see that this is the you know, the, the church voice of course crumbling because there's no there's there's not even a thing where you go in and it says here you can make contributions because who would get the money? Uh, it's 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 just a mess. Uh, so. Uh, in the hotel that we're going to stay in, there is in Jerusalem, there is a there is a print of, of, a, of a sketch of a drawing that was done in 1865. That ladder is there in that drawing because it's been there for at least 250 years. So it's or you know, so it's it's uh anyway that we're gonna we're gonna see lots of stuff like that. Um, the Byzantine era comes to an end, or at least in Jerusalem, comes to an end during the first Muslim era, um, where um, a, number of, uh, a number of caliphates start to fight over, you know, mostly the area of Syria and, and parts of Turkey and things like that. But they drive out the Byzantines to about this area, which is, which is today Turkey, Constantinople's up here. Um, they rule Jerusalem and different, different uh, potentates run Jerusalem for about 400 years. Um, and they are responsible for a lot of the architecture. The most important one that we'll see is the Dome of the Rock. That goes, that happens during the first Muslim period. The Dome of the Rock is so named because it is built over this rock on the Temple Mount that in Muslim tradition today was the rock upon which Muhammad stood and ascended into heaven. It is the rock which Jews believe is the today anyway is the is the rock upon which Abraham sac offered to sacrifice Isaac and it was around that rock we believe that the temple was built so probably where the where the temple was the temple of Solomon and everything is enclosed mostly by that piece of real estate that the dome of the rock is over the dome of the rock is a 
shrine, it is not a mosque. The building behind it right here with the dome, this is a mosque. Um, and, and people do go out and, and pray in the mosque. It used to be that we were able to, to go into, people were able to go into the dome of the rock and see the rock and things like that, but in the last 20 or 30 years, that's the security issues are such that we can still wander around on the Temple Mount, we will, uh, but we can't go in there anymore. It's also important to note, I'm going to send this around um, with, with biblical sites. Whenever you read something in the New Testament that says Jesus was in the temple teaching, in the temple almost never means inside the actual building, because for the most part you could go into, if you were not a priest, you could go into the courtyard, but going into the building itself was, was reserved for the priests and the Levites. So in the temple means on the temple mount. So we will be, we will be walking around, and it's huge. And it's easy to understand why Jesus could um, upset the apple cart at the tables and everybody changing money on one part, and people, you know, someplace else wouldn't have even known there was anything happening uh, because, it's, because it's so big. Uh, the first Muslim period comes to an end during first uh, during the area what I'm calling the Crusader era. There are three or four Crusades. Um, you will see uh, this. And, uh, these are these are maps pulled from the internet, so some of them may be more accurate than not. But um, but frequently you'll see as as the, the Crusader era is, is times when people in the West, not in the East, Christians in the West, decide we're going to go and we're going to liberate the Holy Land. <laughs> Um, and get rich and stuff like that. Um, almost all of them end up going through Constantinople and frequently sack Constantinople, an entirely Christian city. And it's during this period, because of the sack of Constantinople by the Crusaders, set because the Pope said, said go do this to the Holy Land, that the Pope and the, you know, the Bishop of Rome and the Bishop of Constantinople, the Patriarch of Constantinople, mutually excommunicate each other's, and this is the first split in the church, the, the Eastern and the Western churches. Um, because the Crusaders generally were equal opportunity plunderers. They, they did kill a lot of Muslims, but they killed Jews, they killed Christians, uh, not, not infrequently. Um, they are not known for, for um, leaving behind hugely great uh, architecture, most of their architecture was, was pretty poorly constructed. There are areas we're going to see that are uh, remnants of Crusader era. Uh, so this is, uh, this is in Caesarea Maritima. So there's two Caesareas we're going to go to. One is uh, Caesarea Maritima. It's right on the Mediterranean coast. It's, it's the more important, really, for several reasons. Um, Caesarea Philippi is up north of Galilee. Um, we go there too, but the uh, this, this kind of sloping, I, I learned this actually in Ireland recently, the sloping of the walls like this uh, was, was intended to prevent people from, from tunneling under the walls because it made it harder for them to be able to tunnel in the by sinking the walls. Um, but there are some remnants of, of Crusader era fortifications that we're going to see. And like I said, all this stuff is all piled on top of each other. You're going to see the Roman era, the Byzantine era, the Crusader era. Um, the Crusaders, lose uh, Jerusalem about um, back, oops, about 1200. Pretty much all the Crusaders have been driven out of the Holy Land. Um, the Ottoman Empire, which is, is kind of a coalition of, there's, there's a lot of fighting between various Muslim groups. Um, but finally, um, finally by 1516, the Ottomans really rule the roost. This is the entire, there's, there's color coding here. But, uh, but basically, everything, all the Medina, uh, Mecca, Jerusalem, all the Muslim holy sites are held by the Ottoman Empire. They are, here's Vienna. They are right at the gates of Vienna, which is why in, in 1516, 1517, the Holy Roman Emperor really, really wants the Lutherans and Catholics to get it together, not because he really cares about theology, but because he's really, really worried that Vienna and everything else here is going to get overrun by the Ottoman Empire. They are the, um, the Ottoman, uh, Suleiman the Magnificent, who is the, who is the um, Sultan at that time, uh, largely rebuilds Jerusalem and the, the wall that completely encircles the old city, what is today the old city, uh, was built in the 16th century by Suleiman the Magnificent. Uh, I include this slide. Uh, this, is a, this is a nighttime slide near the Damascus Gate. But I talked about in the first presentation 
how the area is, is very seismically active because it's built on fault lines. You can see how the, how the, how the rock is just <laughs> and kicked up by the various earthquakes that have happened around it um, and the, the walls are built on top of that. So a lot of the, a lot of the stuff we're going to see uh, also, also is, is influenced by the, the Ottoman period, which, hap which, which goes on for about 400 years until the end of the First World War. Towards the end of the First World War, the Ottomans uh, end up on the, uh, on the losing side of, of World War I, and the British end up doing a bunch of things. But towards the end of the, uh, the Ottoman Empire, at the end of the 19th century, the, uh, the, the, in, spite of the, in spite of the fact that the Ottoman Empire began with the Holy Roman Empire and the Germans fighting the Ottoman Empire, the Kaiser and the Sultan become good buddies. And the, uh, the Kaiser and the Sultan, uh, uh, because of that, end up allowing uh, German, arch German archaeologists to come and start doing actual, what we would think of today as modern archaeology, sort of. Uh, they're, they're, they're looking for things in the past. So um, back to here, um, the Ottoman Empire at that point, all of the things that are Babylon, which is down by Baghdad, um, cities of the, of the of Revelation, which are in modern Turkey, all these things end up getting uh, excavated by, by German archaeologists who take much of it back to Germany. Mm -hmm. um, so when you, when you go and visit um, uh, Pergamum today, Bergama in, in, uh, in Turkey, which is on the, on the coast here, it's one of the cities of, of, uh, of Revelation that John writes to, uh, there is a foundation from the Temple of Zeus. And there is the grave of the German archaeologist who excavated it. If you want to see the temple, you got to go to Berlin to the Pergamon <laughs> Museum on, the, on Museum Island. And they also have the actual Ishtar Gate from Babylon, which they brought back and during the Second World War. They packed it in sandbags it's in the basement and survived. And it's, it's a fascinating thing. But um, uh, that, was, that was towards the end of the period where you go, you do archaeology, and you move other people's antiquities. Um, it is, it is often the case that Americans want to go places and go, you know, we're number one, we're number one. One of the things we can be proud of as Americans is at least in terms of looting other people's antiquities, we are not number one. The <laughs> British, they are number one. The French are really number two. The Germans were trying to get into the, into the thing, but World War I got in the way and that, that ended that. Um, but, but that period ends up being the first time that people were actually trying to excavate and find out what things were like to preserve that that thing. You're going to see a lot of stuff like this. I decided to, to throw this in. This is, I think, from Bethlehem. You're going to see a lot of these, these silver stars over marble with all these oil lamps hanging and things like that. Um, so this is the actual spot, the very actual spot upon which Jesus was born in Bethlehem. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, who knows? Um, however, the, the church of the Nativity is built upon a pagan temple that was that was you know, a place where Christians, at least in the first century, thought this was, this was where Jesus was born. Um, but the way that things were done in the Byzantine era, if you thought this is the site, you paint paradise, put a, you know, put a parking lot, you, 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 you pull everything away, you put this little shrine, you have no idea, you know, what you're looking at. So we're going to go to some places that are not the actual site. Uh, we're going to go to the Garden Tomb, which is right down the street from the hotel. Uh, it is really a first century tomb. You get a sense of what a tomb would have, would have looked like. Um, it's in the wrong place to be Jesus' tomb, but, but because when you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you're going to see nothing that looks like a tomb, because they do this kind of stuff. Um, but the, uh, the, that, that period is important because it's the beginning of, of actual excavation and study, and, and it has some interesting side effects. So, um, one of the things is that this, this dome way back here, this is the dome over the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, this great big massive uh, church here with the bell tower and uh, it's, it's medieval, uh, it's kind of crusader era, uh, is the Lutheran Church of the Redeemer. Now you might ask yourself, self, how is it that Lutherans who constitute a tiny, tiny, itty bitty little fraction, of, I mean first of all hardly any Christians anymore in the Middle East, but, but how do Lutherans, who are a fraction of a fraction, end up with this huge building on a major piece of real estate inside the old city 
literally right next door to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And the answer to that is the Kaiser and the Sultan were good buddies, and at the end of the 19th century, the Sultan gave the Kaiser that church. And among the Kaiser's other idiosyncrasies and, and failings, uh, the Kaiser was a Lutheran, built the Berlin Cathedral also, um, so gave it to the Lutheran Church in Germany, which continues today with the Lutheran Royal Federation to administer that site. It is actually a cathedral. It is the seat of the bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land. Uh, there are three services run every Sunday in Arabic, in English, and in German. And there's also, like, periodically in Danish and Norwegian and all kinds of other things. We will go to the English service on, on uh, Sunday, <laughs> which, is, which is led by, which is led, right now, I think, is led by a clergy couple who are in the LCA uh, couple who are there. Uh, so there's interesting side effects to all these periods. Um, the, uh, the Ottoman Empire comes to the end. Uh, or the British take over towards the end of the First World War and, and codify that uh, in 1920 with the, with the peace treaty. So they, they occupy what is today Iraq, Jordan, uh, French or in Syria, all of, all of what is mostly today uh, Israel, the Palestinian territories, uh, some of Jordan, things like that. Um, they occupy it. Uh, they are, they are the administrators of it through the end of the Second World War. And it's during this time that there, there, have, you know, there have always been Jews, there have always been Arabs, there have always been everybody living there. But it's, but it's during the, the time between the first two world wars that, that more Jews come to start settling in the area known as today's Israel. So at the end of the Second World War, especially because of the Holocaust, there was this desire that we are going to set up a state that Jews can live in, and it's going to be a Jewish state, and you know, somehow or other we're going to make it possible that Arabs can, and Muslims can be there too, and what are we going to do with Jerusalem? So, um, so their concept, the UN concept here in 1947, was to create two states, the proposed Arab state, which is all the, the tan area, the proposed Jewish state, which is all the blue area, and to have this whole area around Jerusalem and Bethlehem to be an international administration city, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, the, the British and the United Nations tried a whole bunch of stuff like in Iraq and stuff like that. It worked out so well there, it's, it's amazing that it wouldn't have worked out here. Um, but uh, you, you look at that for a second and you can immediately know that that's going to please nobody. So um, the Israelis, or the, you know, the Jews at that point, um, declare independence in 1948. The Egyptians, the Jordanians, this is in French, the Syrians all get pissed off at that and they invade. The Jews fight back, shut them out. So, uh, so after the um, so after the um, the July 1948 Israeli uh, counterattacks, uh, the, the Israelis push the Arab armies back to what is today more or less the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and they take everything else. Uh, and that's the way it stays, and they do not occupy the West Bank or the Gaza Strip, but that's the way it stays until the 1967 war when they actually went in, because again, they were attacked and they, were, they went in. And they, they occupied the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, the Sinai Peninsula, if you remember from back then, when uh, this was this was given back to Egypt in 1979 uh, with a peace accord between um, um, Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin. That was that was one of the few times that there was actually a, a, a real peace treaty. Um, uh, but they also took back the Golan. They also took the Golan Heights because this was a major way that that they were going to be attacked from the, from the heights up there. So today. Um, Israel still uh, occupies all of this area and the Golan Heights. Uh, they do not occupy the Gaza Strip, but um, that's basically been the status quo, except that they have been, there has been a Palestinian authority which is in control of some of the areas that we're going to go to. If you take a look closely at this map, uh, so this is, this is kind of the West Bank area, this is Gaza. The, the, the dark green areas are the 
day glow goofy green areas are the are the areas controlled by the Palestinian Authority. The other area, the, all these little um, all these little triangles are Israeli settlements within the West Bank, which is a major source of, of the conflict. Uh, but if you if you take a very close look at that, this is like a Rorschach blotch. It, it would be impossible for the Palestinian Authority, if they wanted to, and sometimes they don't, to control what's going on in, in these discontinuous areas. And it's impossible for the Israelis to provide security in places, which, which ups the ante of the, of, of the problem. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we will and will not do and will and will not see um, as we go into, into the West Bank. I, I want to I first of all point out, so sometimes when you go on these trips, um, the tour company will, will, will set up something where you, they will bring in a Israeli person who will tell you the Israeli side, a Palestinian person who will tell you the Palestinian side. Um, it's way too complex for that. And often you, you end up being told to drink the Kool-Aid Kool of one side or the other. Um, so I'm not, I, I, have, I have not asked for any of that. Okay? Um, I do want people to listen. To, to what you hear from people, especially from people that are not the, um, you know, the official spokespeople who are going to tell you the way things really are and really are. You, you learn a lot um, just by listening to people. Um, what, I, what I have learned as I have been there is that the vast majority of people you talk to really just want to go to work, go to school, go to the beach, live in peace with each other. Um, but there are extremists on both sides and and both sides have legitimate, real, uh, legitimate reasons to feel victimized by the other. And, and um, you know, you hear the same story from different people. They just sort of omit certain things. So when you talk to um, when you talk to Palestinians, they'll tell you about how the Israelis lock them in on the one side of the wall. They can't get to work, and that's true. When you talk to Israelis, they tell you about how before the wall was there. Bus bombings happened all the time, and bus bombings went down by 90% in Jerusalem after the wall went over in Bethlehem, which the Israelis don't tell you, which the Palestinians don't tell you. Um, it is not a good situation pretty much for anybody. Uh, one of the things that uh, Rabbi Jacob uh, would talk about over here, he says, you know, he says 20 years ago, there were not hard borders between many of uh, oops. There were not hard borders between a lot of these places. So, so Palestinians and Israelis, they work together, they vacation together, they, you know, they, they walk the streets together. And he said, uh, you know, today, if you are an Israeli kid growing up in Israel, the only Palestinian you see is somebody being being walked by the police who's trying to blow something up or is, is under arrest. If you are a Palestinian kid growing up in the West Bank, the only Israelis you see are soldiers who are marching through your, seats, through your streets with ARs, you know, assault rifles. So he says, you know, it, it does not, it's not a good situation for, um, for the security of Israel. Um, but he says, on the other hand, you know, this, um, the whole idea that, you know, we'll just take down the walls and everybody will be happy and be nice to each other isn't going to work either. Um, so you, you end up, and, and, and part of the thing, and this is, this is my personal take on some of this, having watched this, is that, is that the sides, um, the official leadership of both sides right now tend to be more extremist. So you know, the, the Israeli government, which is, which is now in flux, um, tends to be dominated by nationalists who, who frankly are fine with driving out every last Palestinian because it's our land and they can't be here. And the Palestinian Authority, partly, at least in the Gaza Strip, is run by Hamas, which is a terrorist organization whose, whose stated purpose is to destroy Israel. You know, I mean, if, if, if we, uh, if, if in Frederick County, um, there was a, there was a, there was a, you know, was, was being run by an organization which said we are going to wipe out everybody in Montgomery County and kill them, we would have a real different view of, you know, Frederick County. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I tell the story about uh, our, our tour guides, for example, will not, will not talk politics, they're not supposed to do that. But if you ask people, 
you know, individually. People will tell you things, and you got to read between the lines. But I, I did, I did ask our tour guide in 2009. We were standing on, standing near the Temple Mount, and he was pointing out to us that, I, and he was, he was an expat American Jewish person, and he said, over here is the, over here is the, you know, the Temple Authority, the new Temple Authority. And they're ready to go in as soon as we're able to take that mount back. We're going to knock down the dome of the rock and rebuild the temple and start sacrificing animals. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And you know, but you can see the Israeli flags of, of people who, who have bought the Palestinian homes in that part that's supposed to be Palestinian. And so you know, you can you can feel the tension. And I said to I said to David, I said, you know, I said, just your perspective. What would it take? for people to be able to just live here in peace, Muslims, Jews, Christians, we can all come, we can all, you know, and, and without even a second to think about it, he says, oh, I can't, it's us or them. And, and you do see some of those attitudes on both sides. And um, on the other hand, he also told the story, he says, do you have any idea what it's like to have one of your best friends get on a bus to go in the morning, to go to work in the morning, and the bus blows up because somebody came in and says, Honestly, no, I don't know what that's like. You know, and, and but that's the kind of stuff people live with over there, and and that's why you know I I, I continue to uh, think that the Ted Schneider way of doing this is the best, which is we don't live there, we don't we don't experience it. Listen to people. I, I've never had anybody uh, somebody ask me like, what should I wonder what I would say if somebody asked me what I thought. No one asks what our thoughts are. Um, but it's, but it's, or cares. You know, we, we Americans think somebody cares about our, you know, our, what we think, but they don't. Um, but, but, you know, listen to people. Um, it's been very, it was very interesting to listen to, uh, to Palestinian Christians, to about what, because they're really kind of neither fish nor fowl. Uh, they are, the, the Israelis consider them to be Arabs. The, large number of Palestinians consider them to be not really because they're not Muslim so uh, they and, and, the Pal and the Christian population of uh, of the whole area has, has dwindled it used to be that Bethlehem was uh, was like 80 percent Christian and today it's like 40 percent Christian or something a lot, a lot of a lot of Palestinian Christians have simply left uh, but for, for purposes of, and we will see, sir, oops, <laughs> we will see, but we will see things. So um, this um, is the fence. Uh, we have maximum security prisons in the United States, but this is the wall the, 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 that walls off Bethlehem from the rest of the, the area. Um, the, um, and, and you go into the Palestinian Authority, but, but when that's closed, if you got a job on the other side of it, you don't get out, and they close it for weeks. Uh, so that's part of the problem. Uh, on the other hand, like I said, when that wall went up, bus bombings went down by 90 percent. Um, my own personal opinion is that is that the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which was which was doing a lot of those things back then, picked Bethlehem as a spot because Beth Bethlehem is to Jerusalem as. Um, you know, Rockville is to Gaithersburg, they're that close. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a good launching point, and, and it was a city full of Christians. Mm -hmm. So, who cares if they wall off that one? Um, mm -hmm. By the way, uh, so this is this is the picture of the wall. Uh, I, I, I should point out, you are not allowed to take pictures of the wall. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you are in deep trouble if you do that, so I take pictures. probably things. true for anything. Security. They will. They yes. will. They will. As we travel along the Jordanian border, um, the, the, it's, the, it's the Jordan River, and they will tell you, "Do not take pictures out there. You can't see much." Uh, but there are uh, there are things where, if you were trained to know what you were looking for, you would you would you would see things. I, that that got explained to me by an army officer one time. He says, "Yeah." He says, "You know, you, he says, you know, look over there. You see how there's a there there." there that shouldn't be vegetation there. I wonder why. Uh, you know, there's 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 things like that. So uh, so we will you know there you will not be able to not see some of the things that are going on, and, and, and you should know what you're looking at. And there are some some of the fences are just fence, and some of the fences are and, and we'll we'll go through checkpoints. There may or may not be times when um, when we have to change uh, tour bus drivers when we go through the through the Palestinian sections. We've I, that that has happened before. I, I've 
I have not asked that question to, uh, to Julie, who is our, our tour guide. I have been in contact with her. Uh, it won't matter. We'll stay on the bus and come out from the bus and stuff like that. Um, tour company always takes good care of us like that. Uh, from the, from the uh, go up to the top of our hotel, and uh, where there is now a nice place to sit out and have a drink. You can look down, um, which, which can't really see it. All of these are UN cars that are peacekeeping forces, so you, know, you, you, you will be able to, to see that kind of stuff. Which, which is to say that um, you know, we're, we're going to a place that has a long history of, of lots of different peoples trying to figure out how to make it all work together. Uh, it's frequently been in situations where folks are in conflict with each other. It's still that way today. Uh, there are many layers overlaid. Uh, so it's, it's, part of, it's part of touring a place that is still a living place with, with lots of different people. Uh, but I end on the, on the happier note of, so this is our, um, this, is one of our this is our principal drinking hall. Um, <laughs> uh, this, this is our buddy Ramon standing next to me. Uh, he is the last Christian merchant on the street that when we go into the Damascus Gate. I, this is from 2013. I hope he is still there. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. Um, he has interesting, you know, perspectives about how you, you know you, you, you live in that area. Mm -hmm. um, he has he, he will there is there is Palestinian beer, there is Israeli beer. He sells everything and really good pomegranate juice, which he tells you is different than anything you drink in the country in the United States mm -hmm. because he knows how to make it. Um, so we will we will have a it'll it'll be a good experience that you know we'll be able to it'll be totally it, it will be totally safe. Uh, anytime there's anything bad. They will send us someplace else, mm -hmm. um, which has never happened in, in the two times that I've been over there. Um, going to go over some logistical things, and <clears throat> all of these things are going to be memorialized to you in an email. And I'm going to take notes in case you ask me stuff I didn't think about writing down, and I will probably update that as as we get closer. Um, but but uh, stuff to bring, packing, and things that you need to have. Uh, first of all, pack light. I think I, I talked about this real early when we were doing the, the pre-sessions. Um, uh, no more than one check bag, one small carry-on kind of thing. Um, make sure that you have room in case you want to buy souvenirs that you can, you know, stuff them in there. Um, absolutely important things: bring a good hat. I, mean, I, have, I have a hat that has brims that cover the neck, and the, uh, the, the sun will rip the hide off. October is a nice time to be there. Apparently, Jerusalem in October has an average of one day of rainfall, uh, so it's a, it should be a it should be a nice sunny experience. But especially when we go places like we're out on the um, on the Sea of Galilee and in the boat, and it just reflects up, and it's you will you will die without a good hat. Um, um, bring good walking shoes. Make sure that there's. Um, uh, and sandals for walking in Hezekiah's tunnel, because we will we will be walking we will be walking through a tunnel, and I, I have not been there, so it's going to be cool for me to be able to. But but the, but apparently um, maybe Pastor Christine can stand upright in it. Um, but, it's, <laughs> but, it's, but it's really low, and and it's about it's about knee deep in water. So um, so oh, you want to be able to, you, you want to huh? <laughs> yeah, well yeah, and, and there's and, and you've got to have shoes in it because you're. you're because there's there's rock. I mean everything is rock there. So so have some kind of like sample or something you can um, you can use for that. Because you, apparently you get money and it's just a mess. And so you, you'll want to be able to change shoes. Bring bathing suits uh, to be in the in the Dead Sea. Um, we have a couple of opportunities for that. Um, do bring a light jacket or fleece because uh, because you will have um, it, it will be cool at night and and. We have the potential to be in air conditioning in places that are, you know, we bus we should be able to tell people to turn their AC up or down. Like, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's good to have that. Days are going to be warm. Um, I, I did get in contact with Julie, who is our tour guide for the Israel portion, and she said shorts are fine. You can wear shorts. There are times when um, I will read you exactly what she said. Shorts are fine, uh, but people will need modest dress for holy places. This means no sleeveless. Uh, no sleeveless shirts, short sleeves are fine, and pants below the knee. And she says, women can throw on a cover-up for those places, but I will always let you know the day before if you need to dress like that. So other times, 
you know, you'll be able to wear shorts and t-shirts. And, well, well t-shirts always work. Um, obviously, bring passport. Uh, they won't let you on a plane without it. Um, photocopy it, keep it with you, because uh, we don't want to have a problem with that. Um, you don't, you, we do not need visas to enter Israel. We do need a group visa that we go into in Jordan, but that's taken care of. Though what they will do is they will, you know, move, the bus will approach the Jordanian border. They will take our passports. They will take them in. They will stamp them with a group visa. We'll get on another bus in Jordan, and you know, proceed from there. Um, and, and that's not, that's there's no cost to that. Um, when you, when the last time that I was in Israel, and this was not the way the way it was in 2009, but it could have changed. They gave me this little fortune cookie like <clears throat> piece of paper when I got to Tel Aviv and said, you need to keep this with you for when you leave. Um, I don't know if they're still going to do that, so I kept it. They didn't attach it to the passport. It's not a stamp that goes in the passport, so it's really easy to lose, but you know, but I held on. So they didn't take it from me when I when I went into Jordan. But when I came back into Israel through Jordan, they gave me another piece of fortune cookie and said, here, here's this one. So I said to the customs guy, I said, so when I leave from Tel Aviv tomorrow, do I give him this fortune cookie? Uh -huh. I didn't call it a fortune cookie. Do I give him this fortune or this fortune? And he's like, uh, I don't know. Maybe that one. Uh, but if they give you stuff like that, don't lose it just in case. Um, cash, charger, cell phones, stuff like that. Um, you're going to be able to use U, uh, U.S. dollars pretty much everywhere. Uh, everything we everything we do, including the places we stop for lunch and drinks and stuff like that, all the tourist things that people want to sell you off the bus, they will take U.S. dollars. Uh, they will take credit cards and charge you in dollars or shekels or or euros, whichever you know usually you want. Um, do bring smaller amounts of you know because everything you're going to be buying is going to be little stuff. It's going to be lunch or drinks or you know, throw in a dollar for a bottle of water or something like that. Um, ATM is available at baggage claim at the Tel Aviv airport. Otherwise, they are hard to find. Uh, ATMs are difficult to find, you know, on our, as we travel around where we are. Um, so, so don't plan on finding those. Um, what else did I want to say? Uh, yes, phones. Um, phones, phones should work everywhere. My phone has always worked in Israel and Jordan, uh, especially if you have Wi-Fi. Use the hotel's Wi-Fi um, for text messages and sometimes for, for, for calling as well. But uh, Israel has CDMA as well as GSM, so uh, I think everybody's phones are GSM now here. So, um, but do check, do check your carrier because Verizon. Verizon gave me two things, and I had the more expensive one the last time I was there, and did not realize it. So check. <laughs> You know, make sure you, you check that, but there shouldn't be anything you need to do. I believe that um, almost everything, including, you know, my iPhone and everything everything else I've taken in the last 10 years, has worked on 110 and 220. Israel, Israel, like everybody else in the world, has 220 volts. Almost everything that you're going to bring, which are, you know, like phones and um, iPads or camera battery chargers, that should all work on, uh, on 220, but do check that. Just to make sure, yes. I wanted to bring my work laptop and was strongly discouraged from doing so. Yeah, um, yeah. especially if especially if you do security stuff. You, yeah. We are gonna we are gonna have um, most of the wire you know, wireless in in uh, the hotels is generally not secured. So um, you know don't don't do yeah don't 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 do any. I mean I don't think you're gonna have a lot of problem with. Um, it's not like going to China. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, but I but I don't know. Yeah, so if, yeah, don't don't watch out for the stuff like that. Um, I figured you know I bring my laptop. It has some servants. You want to hack in and read my servants? Go for it. Um, thing about the uh, hotel Wi-Fi. We we're staying in. We'll, we'll stay in very nice hotels that are tourist hotels. They do have they do have uh, they do have high speed internet. Uh, but you and 500 of your closest buddies are going to all be trying to upload pictures at the same time, so sometimes it crawls. Mm -hmm. So don't don't expect blazing hot speeds. Mm -hmm. um, but Type C adapters, which is the European, you know, the, two, the continental European two prong, that should work. There's like half a dozen possible ones that could be used in Jordan, but but um, the Samantha says you know, usually those have worked everywhere that. 
people. There are occasions, um, there are occasional hotels because they cater to American tourists that actually have U.S. plug mm -hmm. things uh, that happen sometimes but don't count on it. Hair dryers should be in all the rooms, so you shouldn't have to, to, to worry about that. Um, all of the tips that you would normally give to people that you might do at hotels and restaurants, well, all that's included in the price you pay for the tour. Huh. So there's no there's no tipping that you need to do, and that includes, um, especially to point out to people you know, if you've just had a replacement, that they will that the standard service is they take your bag from the bus, they carry it to your room, you put it outside your room, they take it and they bring it back down. That's the standard service. Now, if somebody does something that is you know outstanding and you want to tip them, feel free to do that, but, but there should not be any reason to do that. The only tips that we're going to do are, is, is we are going to take up um, an extra tip for the driver and for the tour guide in both the Israel and the Jordan uh, trips. So, so you know, do bring along some cash for that or you know, something that you can do. Um, let's see. Okay, travel, um, travel protocols. Um, talked about um, the don't lose your fortune cookie piece of paper if they give that to you. That's that's real important. Um, everywhere we're going to go is safe. Um, there's they, they they have as as these tour companies like to point out they have never lost a tourist yet, <laughs> and they and we're not going to be the first. Um, if there is if there's a problem, um, if there's a problem, they will. They won't just tell us we're not going here today. We're going to go someplace else, and they and they will modify it for various reasons. Um, the, we were in um, up near the Sea of Galilee in the morning. You can look out over the sea, and and in 2013, it was a you know it's like Snoopy says it was a dark and stormy night. It was a dark and stormy morning. The, mm -hmm. the, and and the, the water looked like you know yeah it's a little bit choppy, but you know the first thing we're supposed to do is get on the boat. And, and I thought, I thought oh, this, that shouldn't be a big deal, and that's because I have never served in the United States Navy. <laughs> there were a couple of people who had, who I ain't going out on that. This is, and so they said, you know, we're not, yeah. the tour company said, we're going to go over here first, and then we're going to come back, and so we did the boat later. And those, those kinds of things will happen. Um, the Israeli military did close the Allenby Bridge while we were there because they were doing a training exercise, so we had to go all the way up to Beit Sheon and come back around. So there, there are possibilities of things like that. But there was never a situation like there's a riot going on in this city, so we're going to not, you know, we got to get you out or something like that. But if anything, if, if there was anything bad happening in a particular place, they will make sure that we're not, that we're not there. So um, Israeli security is really tight, which is a good thing. Um, but do plan to have, uh, to spend more time at customs and security checks than you're used to in the United States. Um, last time uh, that I was there, so like when we leave Israel, we start, this, this will be the, <clears throat> the most horrible part <clears throat> of our trip. If, if you are coming with the regular group, Bob and Wendy are going to make sure that they get a chance to have a good night's sleep. Um, we are, on our, on our last day coming out of, out of Jordan, which is Sunday, we will have dinner and then basically go to the airport. There will be no sleep in it. So, because they want us there at 2 in the morning to start going through security check so that we can get on our 5 a.m. flight. So, uh, the first part of that is you stand with your bag. They check your bag while you're with the stuff that's going, that, that's being checked. And they ask you questions about it. They go through it while you're standing there. Um, and then you go through the usual stuff with anything carry on and metal detectors and all that kind of good stuff. Um, Tel Aviv, very safe. Um, also, um, I'm going to go back. Way back here. There we go. Um, way back here. Um, here. Um, all missiles, if there are ever any, come from the Gaza Strip. This little airplane thing up here is Tel Aviv. Missiles can't reach there. Um, the um, let's see. Um, other things about uh, yeah. So plan on plan on. We're just 
we're just going to have to, there's a, there's a, there is a real reason we have to be there at 2 in the morning to get on a 5.30 flight, 5.15 flight. Um, but that puts us in Frankfurt going home at about time for beer. So, <laughs> um, um, be sure to, so even though things are safe, be sure to stay with the group because we don't want to have to look for people and, and delay, the, the, delay the tour. Um, itinerary is packed. I have, I have tried to put this in a sort of fast-paced thing and we don't want to waste time looking for people if you've wandered off or gotten lost. And that's not really going to be hard. We should all have the little, um, the little headphones on so you can listen to the tour guide and um, you know, so people want to go, Carmen, where are you? <laughs> you know, you'll hear that on the, on the thing. Um, the um, evenings, uh, we'll, we'll be free to walk around the hotels. Um, the, uh, you'll, you'll see where we're staying in Jerusalem, which is the Palestinian Christian-owned hotel. Uh, the Palestinian section of Jerusalem is way different than the Israeli section of Jerusalem, and, but it's but it's perfectly safe to go, you know, to walk in. But it's but it's right near the, the uh, Damascus Gate. You can go to the old city and you can see some stuff. If you want to re-see some things that were not there, even so, um, don't wander, don't go by yourself, and and let me or somebody else know that oh yeah we you know we we want to see our buddy Ramon and go have a beer or something like that so that you know we know where everybody is. Um, everywhere we go. Uh, if you've traveled anywhere in that part of the world, you know that there is there is never a moment where people aren't trying to sell you stuff. <laughs> so uh, you are under no obligation to buy stuff at all. Uh, but there will be lots and lots of opportunities to buy stuff. And a lot of it is real, you know, is really inexpensive stuff. Um, tour guide may tell us what you know certain prices are good for that. If you want to buy this, this is the thing. Um, the, uh, the everywhere along the streets, there are places to to buy things. Uh, we will go to shops in Bethlehem that are run by Palestinian Christians who, who make their living by making them. So it's like the um, back in the office, uh, I, brought, I brought that back for uh, Carol, I think one time years and years ago, the, the olive wood Jerusalem cross. The Jerusalem cross is a major symbol of Jerusalem. So uh, there, there will be things that, that um, can support local Christians and it's, it's a nice thing to be able to do if, if, if you're inclined to buy any of those things. Um, I, uh, I, I say, although I have done it, um, like taking pictures of walls, security places you're not supposed to take pictures of, um, I, do not, I, I, I do not necessarily encourage the purchase of antiquities. You, there will be places you can buy antiquities, but if you choose to buy something, make sure that you are buying the antiquity from a licensed antiquities dealer. They have signs from the Israeli Department of Antiquities that say that they are a licensed dealer and that you get a certificate that says, this is, a, this is a genuine article that does two things. One, it ensures that you are actually buying a legitimate thing and not a fake thing. Uh, and the other thing is it, it helps you be able to make sure if you leave the country with it that you have not taken something that is not legal to take out of Israel. And that could be a real pain in the So um, those are So those are the things. So all the things I just said um, is, is this... Word document, which is going to be emailed to everybody, plus anything else that I think of. So, are there are there questions or other issues that I did not cover in that? Let's see, how when you say we um, need to bring cash for things, how much cash would you recommend? You I know it depends on how much stuff people want yeah. to buy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Generally, um, you know, maybe X amount for lunch a day. Yeah. Or so so plan on you know a lot of times. You're, we have buffet breakfast and we have buffet dinner, and people are so stuffed they don't. But, but in general, um, you know, most of the places where they're going to say we're going to stop for lunch, it's, it's going to be a, usually a set thing. Like you know, you get a choice of X or Y because they just you know they're they're feeding tourists, um, and it's usually around ten bucks, um, eight to ten bucks. Uh, drinks, uh, including water, so bottled water, sodas, beer and wine. Um, but, but typically sodas are like around three bucks and bottled water is a buck. Um, so multiply number of days by something like that for, you know, for lunch and drinks. Uh, buses have always had bottled water. The bottled water, usually it's, it's on our system. Take a, you know, take a bottle, leave a buck. Mm -hmm. um, do it before you, you know, at least pay, a, pay your bill before we leave the, mm -hmm. the, the rest of the country. 
Um, the things that the things that you might want to buy from like the tourist people who want to show you little olive wood things or blah blah blah. A lot of those things are a couple dollars. You know, car postcards and stuff like that. Things that are you know things that are that you're going to buy in, in stores where we stop or shops where we stop. Um, almost always we'll take credit cards. So I, I, that's what I tend to do. I, that's that said, I would you know I you know I, I would I would bring a couple hundred dollars anyway, just as a as a you know, and, and maybe a little more for the, some, some tips and things for the, for the bus drivers and depending on which things you're doing. When you say it's nice weather when you wear shorts, like what temperature range are we talking? I can be cold now. Currently. Yes, <laughs> you, should wear, you should bring a parka. Um, <laughs> um, typically, typically days are going to be probably in the, in the low 80s. In the 80s, and, and so we, in the evening, it can get cool. It can get down to in the high 50s. Um, yeah, I think that when I look at the average weather, at least in Tel Aviv, was 61 and 81. Yeah. In the of October. Yeah. So it, it's not it's not but it, you know it's 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 something where you'll want you'll want clothing be, that that it's it's warm going to be warm during the day, but at night you don't want to be probably walking around in shorts and t-shirts. When you say pack lights, <laughs> when you say pack lights um, do we have the opportunity to wash clothes, or do we have to have enough clothes to get us through that? You'll have to probably. Well, yeah, you would have to. You would have to have enough clothes to get you through, because um, while the only places we're going to be for more than, yeah, I, I, I don't recall. I don't recall any of the hotels offering laundry service. So, um, you know. <laughs> I can make it 15 days on a t-shirt and shorts. Well, yeah, I can, yeah. <laughs> I mean, hiking for people for hiking. Yeah, I am. I am. Uh, I am uh, haunted by years and years and years of confirmation retreat, where kids show up for an overnight retreat with six pieces of luggage. And, you know, <laughs> don't do that. Um, but uh, but also, you know, I bring. Uh, so you know, like I. Pack heavy on underwear and light on shirts because you know I can wear I can wear the same shirt forever, um, but um, but do um, do leave some you know leave some room and you, there's there's no way not to have a piece of check luggage so so you know bring a piece of check luggage on wheels obviously but um, but with enough space that if you want to if you want to add things that you buy um, I've bought investments and shofar and stuff that took up volume. <laughs> so it depends on. Other questions about other questions about this or anything. Are any of the pictures going to be available? Like when I come back to a scrapbook? For the pictures you did in the the presentation. Oh, I can I can give you the PowerPoint eventually. Okay. Yeah, you can download the pictures and things like that. And, and this will and be so, so this will be on yes. Yeah, so this will be on. Um, you probably be able. What I what I what I did last time. What I plan to do sometime today or tomorrow when I do this is is I, I blow that up a little bit in the in the video. So if you watch the video, you'll you'll see some of those things again. So you can review. So you know. So I, I intend that so that people can you know, even if you're here, you can go back and review what what we did. If you're your your usual self, don't we just say we don't know you? Yes. <laughs> yes. It, it, it should be it should be possible to deny uh, knowing who I am because I am I am not. Uh, so the the tours are all run by the tour guide. Um, so there's except for the fact that you know that I'm that I am allegedly the host. No one else will know that. So it's, it's easy to disassociate with me. Uh, so are you like the color commentator on the football broadcast? Yeah. I will. I will. I will. I will avoid doing that because um, the the. You can really piss off the tour guide <laughs> if the tour guide's trying to do the spiel and, and you're making comments along that. So I may make comments in the evening over dinner, but I will contain myself as much as it is possible for me to contain myself. And I, I say, um, I, I've not met uh, uh, Julie, whose last name I don't remember, who's our, who's our uh, tour guide, but I, um, the, the Standards for you must you must have a tour guide when you when you have a group over there and they are they are regulated by the Israeli uh, tourism department. They have very high standards and 
we have never had a bad tour. I've never had anybody have a, a bad tour guide over there, so I, I think she's going to be great. We'll, we will have a different tour guide, obviously, when we go to Jordan. Um, I don't know who that is yet. I will probably try to figure that out also. We're only there a couple of days. Is there a free, free time built into the... There is some. Yeah, there, so so we will uh, take when you look at the at the itinerary that's that's still posted on the website and the hard copy. Um, mostly the free time is going to be in the af late afternoon, or early evening, in, in the evenings. Uh, we are we'll probably leave. We'll get up. We'll have breakfast. We'll probably leave the hotel eight eight thirty ish, something like that. We'll we'll go pretty long and pretty hard until about four o'clock in the afternoon, five o'clock in the afternoon, and and then people can. They'll, they always have us back in time to get dinner at the hotel, <laughs> and, right. and then yeah. usually in the evening you can you can you can walk around. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, and if and, and a lot of the shops and things like that are also open uh, as as we go through the um, at least in terms of shopping things like that um, because because we think of this as this is a good opportunity for us to see stuff. The tour company and and everybody else thinks this is a good time for us to. Spend money, mm -hmm. so they always uh, they end up they end up stopping us in places where you can shop right. for way longer than I would like to be stopped there. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you know that's I, I showed that picture of um, of uh, the, the tell in Jericho where you can go up on the top of the on the roof of the building where we're having lunch. You can look down, which which is a great shot. So I did that. I had plenty of time to take people up there and do that because we're stopped for lunch for like 45 minutes for an hour. Not we don't need that. It's a it's a buffet style. Whoosh! You go through there. You can be done in 20 minutes. But they want to have an extra 25, 30 minutes for you to go downstairs to the shop and uh, shop. Mm -hmm. So one thing I did notice from previous trips there, if, if you do not want to buy, don't don't make eye contact. Yeah. With the, with the vendors. Because they'll be on you. Like yeah. You yeah. Yeah. There was a. Um, uh, so everybody, everybody will speak English to you. That's yeah, that's yeah. just what happens yeah. there. But the uh, my friend of mine who said uh, uh, she was in Istanbul on her honeymoon and they they um, there was somebody trying to sell stuff and they, they they were they were apparently they were you know they were many languages. They were like hey 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 and it's, and it, and. And she says, you know, just instinctively, as soon as they said something in English, you turned like, oh, yeah. I heard oh. and that was how they knew, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm on you. So, um, yeah, and it's, 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 people, you know, like, getting on and off the bus, if you look at them, that's what they're going to do. If you, if you just keep walking, they're not really, they're not going to chase you, mm -hmm. so. Definitely. Places to ride camels, but periodically is not you. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I will send out this, the link to this video, I will send out two dot. it will come with two documents. This thing about stuff to remember, which I may update later on, and, um, and also I, I put together a sheet that has the Biblical references to the places we're going to go see, and it has, it has active links, so you just click on it and it goes to the biblical passage. You can take a look at it. Um, the um, when you look when you when I have not included Jerusalem, uh, Nazareth, the Sea of Galilee, things like that, places that are uh, common places you read about all the time. But I but I do include places like Beit Sheon, which figures prominently in Old Testament history and actually sometimes in the New Testament, but it's not immediately obvious to people. So have some take a look at that as well. Anything else? More things. The baby probably made the number. In that case. Good reason to celebrate. Yeah. We must have a drink in honor. <laughs> at least one. I will be in contact with everybody. You know, obviously, as, as the trip gets closer, we'll, we'll you know, keep in contact and make sure. I think I have everybody's travel itineraries, except for Nettie and Susan. Um, if you're not coming with the group, but um, I think I think we're I think we're in good shape for the shape we're in. Stay in good shape. Good. No more things. Huh? Um. About two, four, six, seven, nine. So, uh, so, so, uh, 
significant chunk of people are of the of the 21 of us that are going about uh, you know just just under half of us are coming on some other day um, so you guys are Terry is Nettie and Susan are the Dixons are the Abbots are I think that's it as long as every as long as as long as we got everybody at the hotel in the morning of the, the, that we're supposed to take off and leave, leave uh, Tel Aviv, we're in good shape. Mm -hmm. If that turns out not to be the case, then we can figure it out and, and, and get people in. All right. Great. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.